Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And welcome to First United Presbyterian Church of Crafton Heights this morning. We're glad you're able to join us either in person or via digital means. We have just a few announcements this morning. If you'd like to follow along, you can find these mostly at the back of the bulletin. First, let us warmly welcome Mr. Corey Glett, our preacher this Sunday. Corey is an artist and theologian who has served as a pastor, counselor, graphic designer, filmmaker, and tattoo artist. Corey and his wife, Ruth, have spent much of the last decade living in Haiti, where he has helped to establish an arts-based economic development nonprofit. And currently, they are living here in Pittsburgh. Thank you for joining us this morning, Corey, and for sharing God's word with us. Don't forget, starting this month, you have the option of joining us in person for worship. Simply call or message Treva no later than noon on Friday with the names of the people who will be attending. Attendees will be required to comply with all the best public health practices, and please remember we will not be able to offer child care options at this time. You may also continue to join us for worship via Facebook Live or YouTube. Did you enjoy the Sounds of Worship Sunday that we had in June? Well, guess what? We have another opportunity to share our favorite music with one another. Did you forget to send in a song request, though? Uh, did you think of some songs you wish you could sing more often? Well, you have your second chance now. The worship team will host another Sounds of Worship Sunday on August 23rd, and that is next Sunday. Uh, your song requests are due to either Megan or Adam by today. And you should send those by email, and their email addresses can be found in the bulletin. Remember to send the title of your song and a paragraph about why you like the song or what it means to you. We look forward to seeing your selections and singing joyfully with you. Although the Cross Trainers has come to an end, summer meals will be continuing to be served until August 28th. And that's a little bit different from what's in the bulletin. The bulletin says the 14th or the 21st. It's August 28th is when summer meals will uh, finish up. You can continue to grab uh, to get a grab and go meal for any member of your household, 18 or under, from the kitchen door on Clarehaven Street anytime between 12 p.m. and 1 p.m. Monday through Friday, or until all the meals are given out. Contact me, Mike, at mikechuck.org for any questions or further details. Pastor Dave will be on vacation for the next two weeks. If you experience a pastoral emergency, please contact Elder Barbara Prevost at, well, you can find her contact information in the bulletin. Barbara will help the elders and local clergy present to you in your time of need. That's it for announcements today, though we encourage you to read through your bulletin for any further information. Let us now join together to worship God as the people of God. Let us worship our light and our salvation. The Lord is stronghold of our lives. We desire to live in God's house and to seek God in his holy temple. We have come with shouts of joy to sing and to make music to the Lord. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Teach us your ways and make straight our paths in this hour of worship and always.
times we think we love you well, O oh God, but upon hearing your call to love you with all our heart, and all our mind, and all our strength, we confess that our love for you is a deluded love, made insipid and flat by lesser loyalties and a divided heart. Our love seems pure only for brief moments. Soon our affections are drawn away. How easily our devotion dies. And continuing saying, Forgive us, and deep mercy spare us, despite our lost cursed love for you. In grace, rekindle our love for you, in seeing anew Jesus' love for us. Amen. Please join me in the assurance of pardon to be read responsibly. Here are the words you may trust, words that merit full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. To all who confess their sins and resolve to lead a new life, he says, your sins are forgiven. He also says, follow me. Now to the one who rules all worlds, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Alleluia. Amen. prayer for illumination. May we be reached by what we require most from your word, O God. If we need reassurance, help us to hear it. If our actions condemn us, prompt us to face the evil within that leads to hostile acts. Whatever our needs, speak to us in ways we can understand and move us toward a just response. Amen. Our first reading this morning is the 112th Psalm. Praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in his commandments. Their descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. They rise in the darkness as a light for the upright. They are gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with those who deal generously and lend, who conduct and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. They are not afraid of evil tidings. Their hearts are firm, secure in the Lord. Their hearts are steady. They will not be afraid. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have distributed freely. They have given to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn is exalted in honor. The wicked see it and are angry. They gnash their teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked comes to nothing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in keeping with Dave's tradition, I'm going to come close to the piano. Can you see me over there? All right. All right. 
Now, this is my first ever children's sermon. And I have no little children here in front of me in the, in the live audience, which makes it easier maybe for me. But I'm going to pretend that there's lots of little kids right here. Um, but you know what's wrong is that Pastor Dave gives the best children's sermons I've ever heard. So I might have to tell him sorry for how I do this right now. Um, and that's, that's what I'm actually going to tell you about. Have you ever had to say sorry to somebody? Have you ever had to apologize for something you've done to hurt somebody or to make somebody's, somebody feel bad? Well, when I was a kid, nobody ever taught me how to say sorry. I thought that's all there was to it. You just say, sorry. And maybe if you want to make it really good, you cry a little bit. And, and then just hope that somebody will forgive you. And I realized, I was talking to my wife the other day, that nobody ever taught us how to say sorry. Nobody ever taught us a good way to apologize. So I'm going to give you a little thing to remember. And parents, you might want to write this down too. The word sorry is spelled S-O-R-R-Y. And I use those letters to help me remember how to say sorry, especially when I am in the middle of feeling like I have to make an apology and all my nerves and feelings are really strong and it's hard to remember, what do I do? So it's good to have this little word, sorry, to remember. So S stands for say what you did. Tell the story. This is what happened. You were gone, I went into the kitchen, I reached into the cookie jar, and I ate all the cookies. <laughs> this is the story, so I'm saying what happened, all right? Or, when you weren't looking, I snapped your toy in half. That's telling the story, saying what you did. The O in sorry is for owning up, admitting that it's your fault, okay, saying, you did it. So it wasn't somebody else who took the cookies. It wasn't somebody else who snapped the toy in half. That was me. And owning up that it was wrong. I did something that was wrong. The first R in sorry is for, I got to remember it. See, this is why I have to remember the word, the letters for sorry when I have to give an apology. So the first one is about reflection. Do you know what reflection is? It's like what happens in a mirror. Reflection is the most important part, I think, of apologizing because most people don't do it when they apologize. And the reflection, what I mean by that, is that you say, I bet when I took those cookies from the cookie jar, you felt like you can't trust me in the kitchen anymore. It's saying how you think what you did made the other person feel. Or, I bet when I snapped your toy in half, that made you sad, and, and I know that I caused that. And by reflecting, you make the person know that you feel the harm that you've caused to them. The next R is repayment. It can also be called restoration, but it's I'm going to put, I'm going to help you bake more cookies to put in the cookie jar, or I'm going to buy cookies at the store, or I'm going to convince somebody else who has resources to pay for cookies to be put in the cookie jar. Uh, it's somehow making it right, fixing what went wrong. Uh, restoration. And then the why, I kind of had to mess with the why a little bit but it's you make a commitment to change your behavior. So you say, I don't want to do this to you again. If you tell the story and you have the same story, if you own up to it, if you reflect and show that you understand the feelings you caused, if you make it right by paying for what you took or broke or hurt, and if you make a commitment 
to not do those things again, your apology will probably go over very well. And we also have to know how to, how to receive an apology. We don't say, it's okay. Don't worry about it. No, we need to say, I forgive you. That way we acknowledge that we all came to the table and said, this thing was wrong, and now it's better. All right. Thank you. Our second reading this morning comes from the Epistle of St. James, the second chapter, verses 8 through 13. You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Is this mic on? Okay. The movie The Big Short starts with a quote from Mark Twain saying, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. The irony of that quote is that the makers of the movie seem to know for sure that Mark Twain said it, but he didn't. Nobody knows who actually said it. Uh, so the quote proves itself true. It really ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. The Old Testament prophets were often commissioned to tell God's people that they didn't know God as well as they thought they did, and their worship was missing the point. For example, here's a highlight reel from Amos 5, where God says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let's, let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. Can you imagine? We're in the middle of a worship song, and God interrupts and says, Shut up. Enough already with the singing and the church gatherings. Unplug your freaking guitars and just stay home. Do all that other stuff I've been asking you to do all along. The book of James is coming from this Hebrew prophetic tradition. The author faces a church that knew for sure what its religion was all about. And James has the nerve to tell them that actually what they know for sure just ain't so. In fact, at points, James calls some of the church's perspective worthless religion. What if God himself questioned the value of your faith? It wouldn't be the first time. Jesus said at first, what if God were to say to you, you never knew me? Can you hear the record scratch as the church goes silent reading James' letter? James writes at the end of the first chapter, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. In other words, if you can't watch what you say, if your words are critical and unloving, bitter and accusatory, then you're wrong about thinking that your faith has actually penetrated your heart. Because as Jesus says in Luke 6.45, the mouth just says what the heart is full of. I would add, if you want to know what somebody is full of, 
Just bump them and watch what spills out of them. Count it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of all kinds and just start backstabbing the person nearest to you, talking trash about people you think are clueless. No, no, that's worthless religion. James goes on to give us a picture of a religion of real value. He says in verse 127, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now when I hear that command to keep oneself unstained by the world, I think of that separatist kind of religion that encourages people not to cuss or chew or go with girls who do. The kind of religion that worries that holding hands might lead to dancing. The kind of religion that smothers the flame of childhood friendships with, my mama told me I can't play with you no more. But what does James mean by keeping unstained by the world? You know, the original book did not have chapter numbers, and these letters were read to the churches all at once in one sitting. So this would not have originally been the end of chapter 1, but a cohesive idea flowing into chapter 2, which starts like this. My friends, if you have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, you won't treat some people better than others. Suppose a rich person wearing fancy clothes and a gold ring comes to one of your meetings. And suppose a poor person dressed in worn-out clothes also comes. You must not give the best seat to the one in fancy clothes and tell the one who is poor to stand at the side or sit on the floor. That is the same as saying that some people are better than others, and you would be acting like a crooked judge. My dear friends, pay attention. God has given a lot of faith to the poor people of this world. He's also promised them a share in his kingdom that he will give to everyone who loves him. And then James tells the church straight out that they are mistreating the poor. Orphans and widows are just the quintessential voiceless poor for James, and really for all the Bible's prophetic voices. But in James' day, they had it particularly rough. Even the great beastly kingdoms of Babylon and Egypt had systems in place for the care of orphans. But in Rome, the system was that if you couldn't take care of your kid, they were exposed, just set out in the street to be taken by whoever might find them useful, or to starve, or to be eaten by street dogs. We sometimes get the wrong idea of Rome that because it was an expansive empire with aqueducts and sports facilities, that it was somehow a glorious place. But Rome did not have a sewage system other than its streets. Archaeologists have uncovered Roman street sewers that appear to have been rerouted because they were clogged by too many infant bones. That's how worthless orphans were in the Roman Empire. An environment saturated by attitudes of partiality, privilege, superiority, or to use a buzzword, supremacy, is the context of James' description of worthless, big-mouthed religion, which can't control what it says, and the need for a religion that cares for orphans and widows and remains unstained by the world. The word world here is probably not a great translation. The Greek word is cosmos, which literally means order. It can, it can speak of the order of the world, but it can also be used to talk about putting things in order, ordered systems, or the ordered appearance of things. More specifically, cosmos is often the word used for jewelry, adornment, and decorative ornaments. 1 Peter 3.3 uses the word cosmos this way when it says, do not adorn yourselves outwardly by braiding your hair and by wearing gold ornaments or fine clothing, Rather, let your adornment be the inner self with the lasting beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in God's sight. These prohibitions sound to modern ears uh, like kind of prudish. But Peter is giving value and liberation to women in a culture who were told they were nothing without the latest fashions, which for most people were way beyond their price range. Clement of Alexandria gives us a window into this culture saying, women who wear gold seem to me to be afraid lest if one strip them of their jewelry, 
they would be mistaken for servants without their adornments. Again, here he is using the word cosmos, by the way, which is the, the root word for our word cosmetics. So when James says to look after the orphan and widow and stay unstained by cosmos, right before talking about a class supremacy system in the church based on clothes and jewelry a person wears when they come to worship, he's saying that the pure unstained religion that God requires is to look after orphans in contrast to caring about what kind of bling bling fashion or other display of wealth or excess you can or can't afford. In Haiti, where I usually live, I have many times asked poor kids in my neighborhood if they wanted to go to church with me. And often the response is, yeah, but I don't have the right clothes or shoes to go. They won't be let into the church if they're wearing rags or no shoes on their feet. Other people I've asked, uh, I've asked adults if they're Christians, and sometimes I get the response, um, uh, yeah, I'm clean. I take care of my clothes and my hygiene. Faith and appearance are so in intimately tied in that culture. Now, this association between faith and fashion may feel very foreign to some of us, or maybe not. I mean, we have this idea of wearing our Sunday best. How seriously would you take me if I stood up here and preached in a Steelers t-shirt, shorts, and flip-flops? I mean, what if it was an Eagles t-shirt? <laughs> I mean, we can divide over things other than class. When I wore this t-shirt through the security screening at the airport in Seattle, by the way, the TSA employee looked at me and said, you make me want to puke. I ought to make you go back through that scanner and change into a Seahawks t-shirt. <laughs> Talk about a worthless religion of partiality, privilege, and feelings of superiority. <laughs> but to get to the point, how much do you associate poverty with danger? How much do you mean middle or upper class when you refer to a neighborhood as a good neighborhood? How much do you associate low-income neighborhoods with negative stereotypes of evil behavior? Do you correlate your personal worth to your financial success? Do you need to show your success by what you buy or use? How much do you lose trust and respect for somebody with holes or stains in their clothing? or tattoos or piercings? How much do you think certain jobs or accents or bumper stickers or dietary choices impact the value of somebody's contributions? How much of an insult is it to think of somebody as homeless? Jesus was homeless. The meek will inherit the earth. Beware of worthless religion. James drives this point home in the verse we read at the beginning, uh, verses eight through 13 right before expressing that faith shows itself in good works and acts of compassion and mercy. He says, You do well if you really fulfill the law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but, in, but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I would be surprised if you haven't heard Jesus' summation of the law into the great commandments to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And it should already be clear that James is desperately trying to detangle the church from the grip of partiality, superiority, and partisan divisions such as classism. You should be able to deduce that these same warnings apply to any attitudes of supremacy we would use to divide ourselves. But then James starts to talk about the law, and things get into something that feels like a strange cross between paralegal and paranormal. He starts by saying, hey, look, it only takes breaking one law for you to become a convict. To use a flight analogy, 
You don't have to run into anything big to go down in flames. A simple hummingbird will do. Or in the example given by James, a murder. But whichever law you break, he says, makes you condemned by the law. So it would seem that he's saying you have to be perfect. I mean, that's a little bit of how Martin Luther interpreted the book of James. He thought it was in conflict with Paul's teaching that justification, being made blameless before God, was not something that anybody could pull off by being perfect or through works of the law, but only a gift received through faith. So why is James talking about being judged by the law? I think Luther missed the magic. James does not say that we are judged by the law of Moses, but by the law of liberty. And then he reveals a bit of what he means. Yes, if we break one bit of the law, we are guilty of breaking it all. But likewise, or inversely, if we have compassion, we receive compassion. If we have grace, we receive grace. Compassion, grace, and mercy take precedence over judgment. He states it punitively and negatively to fit with his previous statements about condemnation under the law, that if we do not show compassion, We will be judged without compassion. And this is where I come back to Mark Twain, or whoever it was that actually said the quote. It's not what we don't know that gets us into trouble, but what we know for sure that just ain't so. One of the things I think we know for sure is that God's grace and forgiveness is unconditional. But that just ain't so. God's love is unconditional. And his grace is inseparable from himself. He always has grace. Grace comes naturally to God. Grace is God's style. He invented grace. But our state of being forgiven is conditional on our living out forgiveness to those who have hurt us. This is why in Matthew 6, when Jesus teaches us to pray, he says, well, first he says not to use your words and your location as some kind of display of your superiority so he's in the same vein with james talking about this kind of don't have this big display but he goes on to say the familiar prayer our father in heaven we honor your name we ask for your rule and your desire to be set up on earth as it is in heaven give the bread we need for today and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven those who owe us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then it's as if Jesus knows what the hang-up would be as people were listening to his prayer, because he immediately goes on to say, like wraps up the prayer and says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. He goes from a teaching to prayer immediately to a teaching on forgiveness. It's like, let me tell you how to pray. Wait, you know what? Let me tell you how to forgive people. And I think it's because uh, it, it, Jesus is, is saying, let me teach you prayer, but I know the thing that gets in the way of people receiving from me. It's that they don't want to give the thing they hope to receive. Forgiveness is conditional, and James knows that. Mercy is the loophole in the law. We are saved by grace through faith, but we can't hold on to grace that we don't give. This is why in Hebrews 12, 14 through 15, the holiness that is required in order to see God is correlated to vigilance about not getting bitter. It says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. How do you fall short of the grace of God? Bitterness. Matthew 18 tells it more starkly. A servant with an enormous debt is liberated by his ruler and his debt is canceled as a free gift. But the freed servant turns around and chokes and threatens a guy who owes him some money. And then he imprisons him, demanding the debt be repaid before he will set his debtor free. When the original ruler finds out that the grace that he had given to the first servant was not extended to his own debtor, he retracts his original act of forgiveness and demands repayment, with the guy even getting tortured until he can repay his full debt. And then Jesus says, 
This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Whoa. It's the only time I know of Jesus saying, oh, and then there's this torture piece. Like, if you're holding on to some unforgiveness, we're starting over. This is it. This is the fulfillment of the law. This is where James can say, either you keep the law completely, which he, like Paul, knows is impossible, or you can have mercy on everybody else and receive mercy and have mercy win out over judgment. Do you realize this is what Jesus was talking about when he said to be perfect like your heavenly father is perfect? Not perfect according to the law. The word perfect there is not our modern use of it, but more like full grown or complete. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on evil people and the good people. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? And are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even unbelievers do that. Be perfect, that word complete, be whole. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is whole. No selection, no, no partisanhood or, or, or superiority or supremacy in the way that you choose who you will love and forgive. I hope that's a relief to you. It's what James calls the law of liberty, that we can't perfectly fulfill the law. We all fall short. But we can have the forgiving mercy of God flowing through us like a water pipe. If we receive it, we give it. It comes into us, and it must come out of us. And we don't get to choose where the love and grace of God get to be distributed. No partiality, no worthless religion of exclusivity, privilege, superiority, or supremacy. We get forgiveness by extending it to everybody else. Enemies, friends, rich, poor, Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, fascists, Antifa, everybody. And that is the only perfection that really counts. Not the perfection of your clothes or your hairs or, or your appearance, your accounts, your criminal record, your stats, your GPA, or how many likes, follows, or shares you get. You are just asked to be complete in your love like your father. And you know, he sees himself in you. That is what I have to share with you today. <laughs>
Now is the point in our service where we open ourselves up to God in prayer. We encourage you to share your joys and concerns in the comments on Facebook Live or on YouTube so that me, we might lift one another up in this important ministry. Friends, let us pray. Holy and most gracious God, we thank you this morning for the goodness of your creation. Help us to be good stewards of this world and the resources within it, and help us to celebrate and defend the many different ways that we are bound to one another and to the world around us. God of justice, as we look out upon a world crying in need, help us to be vessels of your righteousness. Grant us the strength to defend what is good and to oppose what is evil in our society and provide us the wisdom that we need to see new possibilities for human flourishing and to work to make them a reality. God of compassion, be with those of us who suffer this morning. Whether it is due to illness, loss, mental or emotional distress, or simply the long, wearying difficulty of life in a pandemic, we lift up to you, all of us, who need your love and graciousness rekindled in our hearts. We pray for this congregation, for its joys and concerns, and for the strength to bear one another up, and we pray for comfort for the afflicted, peace for the defenseless, joy for those who mourn, and love for all of your creation. God of new beginnings, help us to let go of the practices and principles that pull us away from you. Let this time of uncertainty fill us with hope that your mercy and grace will flow down like waters and that from the difficulty of conflict, new possibilities for living together might arise. We pray all these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We've now come to the part of our service where we are called to share some portion of what God has blessed us with back to the body of Christ. If you'd like instructions on how best to give, you can find them located right here in your bulletin. And now I invite us to the offering. We are powerful people who have learned to grab for what we want. What if we were to give with the same intensity? We covet for ourselves what others have. What would happen if we were as passionate about sharing? What does the Lord expect us to give today? Now the prayer of dedication. Again and again, O oh God, you have restored our fortune. Even when we have little, there is enough. And when we share, the blessings multiply. Thank you for treating us with compassion and granting us the honor of serving as your stewards. 
May, get, may these gifts proclaim your peace. Amen. So in the, in the early church, when they would pray, they'd pray with their hands up and their eyes open because they were not in a world separated from what was in front of them. James is all about this. Be alive to God in the streets, in the world in front of you, what you see. So I'm going to pray with my eyes open and say, may the Lord who has forgiven each of us send us out in grace to forgive the people in front of us. Can we see the work that he has for us to do as it is and not be stuck in the world that just ain't so and may you learn to receive god's forgiveness and to extend it to the people in front of you and may you say sorry to the people you need to apologize to in jesus name amen, amen. go in his peace